All right, good evening, everybody. Uh, System Chalk here with the 12th and hopefully 13th part of the Roguelike Dev does the complete Roguelike tutorial. So this, uh, I'm assuming at this point in terms of the video, uh, people would already be familiar, but just in case, um, this is uh, what seems to be an annual event, which is hosted by the subreddit uh, Roguelike, our Roguelike Dev. And uh, for um, 2024, starting July 9th, they are going through uh, this tutorial at roguelike-tutorials.com slash tutorial slash tcod v2. And there's a summary here. So essentially, uh, it's an eight-week event. Seven of them are, um, are spent actually doing the tutorial. And the eighth week uh, seems to be where you sort of show off all of the work that you've done. So this series has been uh, just kind of doing a more or less vanilla run through um, through the tutorial. I have on occasion, uh, if there's a concept in Python that either I'm aware of or I'd like a bit of practice on, <clears throat> these sorts of things are are something that I would like to get a bit of practice on. So I was trying, uh, trying some different things. It didn't always turn out. Um, and uh, I also did get uh, rough, and then I also installed MyPy. So I've been learning a little bit of that. This has resulted in some fairly bizarre uh, doc strings and things like that that I've written. But the aim here is to get these last couple of tutorials done. So you'll notice here that we're on the last uh, sort of published part of the tutorial. And then uh, the remaining videos will essentially be whatever I can sort of put in at the end. And of course, part of that is not just about idea generation, but also specifically having the discernment to see which ideas are going to give sort of the most value for the the end game, uh, while also making sure that I can achieve it within the time frame. Now, um, I, I've also been sort of posting these things. Sorry, anyways, the reason why I wanted to bring up the roguelike dev stuff um, is simply because uh, obviously, as far as an annual event is concerned, if you're going to be doing something that takes about two months and you're coming in right at the end, I think the likelihood of being able to run all the way through uh, in time for the end is unlikely. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's impossible, but I think one thing that's important is to try and set yourself realistic goals. Um, and this is partly just, I say this because I remember when I first tried to learn any kind of programming, I tried to use online courses and what would often happen is that those courses would rely on some sort of external library to simplify things. I think I told this story before, but you know, there's something like, um, you know, they'd use Java, they'd have some learner's library to make it simpler. And just having too many, too many things going wrong. And in this case, usually it would just be that the library was incompatible with, uh, with whatever modern version I was using. Um, this was one of these cases where there were just too many things going wrong uh, for me to be able to make any realistic progress. And of course, one thing that's nice about this event here, I've certainly benefited from people uh, leaving some comments and saying, hey, you know, you said that you had a problem with this. I didn't run into that. And I noticed you you know, didn't have this thing inside. Uh, a couple of the more senior members of the community uh, have also been kindly leaving some comments to sort of clarify some of the, the thoughts that I have or some of the things that I've been running into. But, um, whether or not you are participating in roguelike dev, and specifically maybe if you had started participating and for one reason or another sort of fell off, if you started but haven't finished yet, I would definitely encourage you to see if you can maybe sprint towards that uh, finish. And then of course, you don't necessarily need to wait for an annual event in order to do something. It just happens to be a nice excuse because you've got a bunch of other people doing their own thing there. So. I know that, sorry, it was a longer introduction than I wanted, but uh, I think that there's probably gonna be a little bit of a distribution of, of people at this point where there are the people who maybe didn't know and would want the opportunity. And I don't necessarily think you need to wait a full year before you do some kind of an exercise, but the hope would be that uh, you say, okay, well, that didn't turn out, but maybe I'll, you know, I'll do this on my own time and follow the format, or maybe you wanna do something entirely different. Um, and I definitely feel that the group of people, I don't know, I, I feel it's probably wouldn't be the most constructive thing to take a look at the people who were contributing at the very start and then sort of take a look at the number of people posting by the end of the presentation. I feel that that's probably the wrong kind of um, quote unquote credit or blame. Um, but if you happen to find yourself in that spot where maybe you started or maybe even you started a, a, in a previous year and you've got a 
an unfinished project. Um, this is definitely one of these cases where it might be a little bit tougher because you're trying to do a lot of stuff in between. Um, but there was something that originally interested uh, you, presumably, in this kind of project. And it seems like not a bad time to just maybe try and, and push a little bit further. And of course, uh, for those of you that are joining from the very beginning, um, congratulations on making it there. And I hope, first of all, I hope you found it worthwhile. Uh, I hope you found the series worthwhile if you're watching it. And uh, perhaps I'm also hoping that you have something a little bit more interesting than what I'm developing. Obviously, uh, the opportunity for me to make something really unique uh, would probably be in a future iteration of this. Uh, now, I also, I know I have like a whole bunch of stuff at the very beginning, but this was really just a chance to try and um, acknowledge the event. I'm really happy that Roguelike Dev doesn't just do this, but it's actually quite a welcoming um, community. Obviously, publicly making mistakes is always pretty fraught. Um, and it's actually one thing that keeps me from doing more things like this, because I try not to be too fragile when it comes to some types of feedback, but I do also tend to find, depending on the context and depending on the environment, uh, I can definitely switch off of things um, when, you know, it just kind of feels like it's more of a mechanism for people to pile on as opposed to something to, um, you know, to, you know, maybe built around growth or around, um, you know, lear learning something new. Uh, and so I do consider myself kind of lucky um, that this was the that this was the case here. At least for me, that isn't something that I can always take for granted. So uh, the reason why, again, it's worth uh, it's worth recognizing the effort because things like these don't happen on their own. But I also just wanted to take a minute to at least sort of talk a bit about the presentation or the um, the uh, event here, simply because I don't really have a lot to talk about in terms of review. Part of that is just because it's been a little bit busy on my side. <clears throat> and uh, I think I got the previous sections, uh, part 10 and 11, done a bit earlier than I normally do. So I don't have a very good recollection of them. The one thing I kind of had a feeling about, and I put this on the subreddit, that I, um, I sort of felt that I've been falling into that trap of just like applying things because it tells me to, as opposed to being as engaged with the tutorial. And I mean, to a certain extent, this is going to solve itself because once these are done, I'm, you know, I'm left to my own devices. Um, but that's also something I want to try and sort of correct a little bit uh, to, to just try and, uh, you know, get the most out of these last couple of tutorials. So on that note, we will start by increasing the difficulty. And I can't remember if I said this before, but uh, because this looks like a shorter tutorial, my hope is that we can get through part 12 and 13 in one go. But obviously, I would rather take the time to do it right and do it in a way where I learn things as opposed to try to meet some sort of arbitrary um, YouTube guideline. So, or not even guideline, but some arbitrary YouTube uh, goal. <clears throat> so part 12, increasing difficulty. Despite the fact that we can go down floors now, the dungeon doesn't get progressively more difficult as the player descends. This is because the method in which we place the monsters and items is the same on each floor. In this chapter, we'll adjust how we place things in the dungeon so things get more difficult with each floor. Currently, we pass maximum monsters and maximum items into the place entities function, and this number does not change. To adjust the difficulty of our game, we can change these numbers based on the floor number. The way we'll accomplish this is by setting up a list of tuples, which will contain two integers, the floor number and the number of items slash monsters. Add the following to procgen.py. I should mention too, uh, every once in a while, I, I sort of just jump in and do an update on, um, uh, on my uh, Python environment, so or well, like the, um, the conda environment that I have. So I think this is now at Python... Uh, is it 12.5? I'm sure I can figure that out. It says 12.3 here. Oh, because that's the base. I don't remember what I called this. Yes, I do. I actually see it right here, but... So rough's been upgraded since I started, and uh, Python's now 
for what <laughs> whatever that's worth. Uh, looks like it also has found some problems. Problems I added somehow. Actually, hang on. Okay, we are actually ready to start now. So max. So I don't know if this means, presumably this isn't only two floors that we're declaring here. Max monsters by floor. One, two, four, three. I mean, it does look like they're putting down ranges. So they get progressively more full. The only problem here is that I presumably we want more than just three levels here. I think kind of the whole point of the procedural generation is that you're able to... Um, well, actually, I guess they don't go on forever. Like Starflight never went on forever, and the uh, and Rogue I had a definitive end. So, anyways, I'm assuming right now. So let's see what it says. As mentioned, the first number in these two poles represents the floor number. The second represents the maximum number of items uh, or the monsters. Okay, wait, did it say mats? <laughs> I totally wasn't paying attention when it said the way we'll accomplish this is setting up a list of tuples which contain two entries floor number and the number of items monsters. Sorry, I I'm out I'm out to lunch here. I get it. So I guess uh after That's gotta be per room. Uh, as mentioned, the first number in these tuples represents the floor number. The second represents the maximum in either the items or the monsters. You might be wondering why we've only supplied values for only certain floors. Rather than having to type out each floor number, we'll provide the floor numbers that have a different value so that we can loop through the list and stop when we hit a floor number higher than the one that we're on. For example, if we're on floor three, we'll take the floor one entry for both items and monsters and stop iteration when we reach the second item in the list, since floor four is higher than floor three. Let's write the function to take care of this. We'll call this get max value for floor as we're getting the maximum value for either the items or monsters. It looks like this. Def get max value for floor. Weighted chance by floor is a list tuple int int floor int and it returns an int zero for floor minimum value in weighted chances by floor, which is presumably the list that we put above. If floor minimum greater than floor break else value equals value return current value. All right, let's take a second to work this out. Oh, it wants a doc string probably. Well, I should be able to explain <laughs> explain this for myself here. Oh, and it doesn't like the list. Uh, probably because I use the lowercase now. And it's gonna want a comment here. Yeah. Okay, let's just uh, figure out the logic here. So weighted chances by floor takes a list of tuples. So max items by floor, max monsters by floor, uh, for floor minimum and value in weighted chances by floor. If the floor minimum is greater than the floor, so we're unpacking, um, we'll start with one, one, right? So, um, we've already been given the floor. So basically it can't, 
can't give me a, a result uh, greater than, or sorry, it can't give me the result for a floor that we haven't reached yet. Else, uh, the current value is equal to the value here. Okay, so sorry, I was just taking a second here. So the weighted chances by floor uh, sort of threw me for a loop here. Um, because I was sort of thinking is like, oh, okay, so is the idea here that you have a chance of getting floor one results uh, and that what's happening as you're going through the um, as you're going through the dungeon here, you um, uh, sorry, what am I trying to say? Um, as you're going through the dungeon, you know, you as you start unlocking the later levels, you potentially run into things that you would find on the first level, but you unlock the possibility that you're getting a higher one. So I don't know. I, I again, I'm I'm out to lunch clearly, but um, so this is, I guess, for lack of a better term, this is acting a little bit like a dictionary, save for the fact that we haven't defined the values for the intermediate level. So essentially, here we're taking uh, one, two, and three is getting the one result. Um, which is clearly what it said in the tutorial before. I'm just finally catching up uh, myself. So um, the um, All right, what don't you like about this? First line of a doc string should be... Oh, right, return, not returns. Okay, it doesn't like the else here. Unnecessary else after break. Am I misunderstanding how break works? Break statements breaks out of the innermost closing for and while loop. Yeah, so I guess we can get rid of the else here. And so we know that floor is going to be um, basically a, a value of one or higher. Uh, if it's one, one is not greater than one. So we've already defined that. It'll be assigned current value. Well, I guess we already have a current value zero that's initialized anyway. So. Uh, and it gets assigned the current value based on maximum items of floor. Fair enough. We get to floor two. Well, floor two meets this condition. So we break and then it returns the current value. So that makes sense. Uh, using this function is quite simple. We simply remove the maximum monsters and maximum items parameters from the place entities function and pass the floor number instead and use that to get our maximum values from the get max value for floor function. So let's find place entities. Uh, right, it wants a doc string as well. <clears throat> so here we will clear out. Well, first of all, we need to change the signature. So. We still have a rectangular room, a dungeon. Uh, we now need a floor number. We don't call the randint. I'll confess there's actually a side of me that likes... Oh yeah, yeah, no, we still have that. We just, um, right. Okay, that's not the biggest problem I have to worry about right now. 
Um, yeah, it's not going to like the... So I don't think I can get by with... I think this is the only way I'm going to wind up. Keeping this all on the right line. I think I quite follow why the tabbing is so different for these. Again, I, this thing is going to freak out because of the random number generation, so I don't really know what else is going to going to happen there. Um, I'm going to skip making a doc string for place entities just because I haven't changed enough. And generate dungeon. We need to clear out max monsters per room. And then for place entities, we need to adjust the... Okay, so new room dungeon. dungeon game world current floor. Uh, all right, so yeah, sorry, it took too long to really figure this out, but um, we're now manually assigning what we would um, what we would give to each floor. There is kind of a side of me like you can sort of see a pattern. So when we go from one to four, uh, we add one. When we go from four to six, uh, we add two. Um, so if we wanted, we can sort of follow a bit of a trend. I don't know if we would want to do sort of a linear trend. I don't know if we want to sort of guarantee some sort of uh, failure or finish by ramping up the monsters per floor. Uh, we do uh, we do sort of augment the uh, the player once they hit that level four. So this, um, weirdly enough, actually makes me think a little bit of what I read about some idle game. Uh, so like kind of the math behind idle games, because if you've ever played one of them, right, the whole idea is that you have uh, costs that grow at sort of this exponential rate, but you have um, sort of generators that grow at this linear rate. However, the whole design of those games sort of winds up being uh, giving them sort of a multiplier, right? So if you were to chart these on a graph, you sort of have this, you know, this exponentially growing curve. So something that kind of looks like a U for your costs. And then you're basically going to be hitting a point where with some types of players, and I'm definitely one of these ones where you can kind of have someone who really tries to like grind it out and like pushes as hard as they can to make the current thing work but like just mathematics is is not not working with you here right there is a certain point at which it just becomes impossible to be able to achieve what you want within like a lifetime so and you know no game is worth that anyway so what you do instead is that you have a an item and what will happen is you change sort of the, the intercept for that line. You don't necessarily change the slope of the line, although that can sometimes help as well. And again, changing the slope will help for a while. But if you still have some, you know, some value that's, that's growing um, sort of more than linearly, uh, you are still going to hit that point where the costs are just simply beyond anything that you're capable of handling. So the way they usually do it is they'll just give you something that will uh, change the intercept for the, the generators. And some of the fun is just being able to decide, okay, so let's change the items that give you sort of the optimal outcome around and how frequently do you want someone to do that? You know, the point of an idle game is not necessarily to be constantly micromanaging it. <clears throat> but on the other hand, you don't want to like 
completely divorce yourself from it because other you know at that point it's like what exactly are you doing right why are you playing the game in the first place so not really nice example of this is uh, universal paperclips and um, unfortunately there's not a whole lot of people sort of talking about where they decide where those points are but that's kind of what i'm thinking about here and one maybe extension i can do is rather than just say you know here are some hard-coded values for us to work with how could i develop this in such a way that there's enough challenge that's being given in terms of the growth of monsters and items that people feel like they have a fair shot but that there's a certain point at which maybe the people who are either um you know insufficiently dedicated or maybe people who like you can kind of see me blast through the dungeon a couple of times and i'm not really thinking very carefully about how i interact with the different monsters so how do i start weeding out people like that uh, and and basically make it so that when you get further and further in the dungeon, you really need to start thinking about the specific actions that you're taking. So potential expen uh, extension there, and that's just because you know I I tend to like thinking about how these numbers relate to one another. Okay. Uh, also remove the same variables from. Did I get this set up by the way for? No, I think we need to go here. So also remove max monsters per rooms and max items per rooms from game world. Remove these lines from game map dot pi. Okay, so we've got game map. We want to get rid of that from game world though. So in init, we kill these. Then kill these. And then finally kill these. Also remove the same variables from setup game.py. All right, this is new game engine, right. Now we're adjusting the number of items and monsters based on the floor. The next step is to control which entities appear on which floor, instead of allowing any entity to appear on any floor. The first floor will only have health potions and orcs, and will gradually add different items and enemies as the player goes deeper into the dungeon. We need a function that allows us to get these entities at random based on a set of weights. We also need to define the weights themselves. What are weights in this context? Basically, we could define all the odds of generating a type of entity the way we have already by getting a random number and comparing against a set of values, but that will quickly become cumbersome as we add more entities. Imagine wanting to add a new enemy type, but needing to adjust the values for dozens or perhaps hundreds of other entities. Instead, we'll just give each entity a value or weight, which we will use to determine how common that en entity should be. We'll use Python's random.choices function, which allows the user to pass a list of items and a set of weights. It returns a number of items that you specify based on the weights you give it. First, we'll need to define our weights for the entity types along with the minimum floor that the item or monster will appear on. Add the following to procgen.py. Okay, so I am curious here. I'm actually going to try and get by without adding the dict here just because the convention so far, all of these are for the older version of Python. And most of these have been sort of superseded by... Um, I think some, basically something, you don't need to do the uh, imports anymore. Um, so in this case here, I think if I do a lowercase uh, DICT, we should be, um, we should be good. From entity, import entity. All right, so after max monsters by floor, item chances equals oh, int list tuple entity int. So as expected, that worked. 
So one thing I was a little, well, sorry, no, I wasn't curious, but I kind of said that this is like a dictionary, but we're explicitly using a dictionary here now, so. Tea factories, health potion, 35. So I'm slightly curious here. So we've got 35, 45, 67. Uh, okay, so this doesn't add up to 100, although I don't think it has to because presumably it depends on everything else that's come before. Did I get that right? So 35, 45, add the five and you get 50. Add the two, you get 70. 70 plus 25 is 95. Um, okay, enemy. Chances. Oh, this is interesting. So it looks like with the um, with each of the floors, the way they handle this is they add trolls, like the the possibility of a troll being generated is increasing every two floors, basically. Okay, uh, the keys in the dictionary represent the floor number and the value is a list of tuples. The tuples contain an entity and the weights at which they'll be generated. Notice that trolls get defined multiple times in enemy chances and their weights grow higher when the floor number increases. This will allow tro trolls to be generated more frequently as the player dives into the dungeon, thus making the dungeon more dangerous with each passing floor. Why a list of tuples though? Well, there isn't any examples here uh, we want it to be possible to define many entity types and weights for each floor. For example, imagine we added a new enemy type that appears on floor 5. We could put that as a tuple inside the list along with the trolls tuple. We'll see an example of this in the next chapter when we start adding equipment. With our weights defined, we need a function to actually pick which entities we want to create. As mentioned, we will utilize random choices from the Python standard library to choose entities. Add this function to procgen.py. So after get max value for floor, uh, def get entity at random weighted chances by floor is a dict int list tuple entity int just rolls off the tongue. Number of entity is an integer floor is an int and we need to return a list of entities okay um what i want to try and do here again i'm uh, i'm a little con uh, conscious of avoiding a more automatic approach to the um should there just be one here Okay, never mind. Um, <clears throat> I want to avoid sort of this very thoughtless approach to to this. So what do I think? What do I think is going to happen here? Right. So we've got weighted chances by floor. So that gives us the dictionary that we're pulling from. We have a number of entities, um, and we have our floor number. Okay. So I think I I think I have a rough idea in terms of how this is going to work. So the number of entities we need to get that from get max value for floor. Um, so essentially we're saying it's like, okay, we're going to draw from this set a certain number of times. Um, and the, um, 
what's going to determine that is the floor number that we have, the last uh, parameter that's being passed to this function. And it's like, okay, well, where are we drawing this all from? Well, we're drawing this from sort of the, the table that we have here. Now, I'm not 100% sure how the weighting works for um, random choices. Um, I don't, um, I said earlier, it's like, uh, do these add up to 100 or not? It's mostly just because it, it looked like they should have, but I don't actually think it makes a whole lot of sense for them to add up to 100, given the fact that they're, um, that they're going to be sort of shuffled in at the, um, they're going to be shuffled in uh, with each floor. So, right, so there's only one thing that can be generated, right, which is a health potion. So the fact that it's got a weight of 35 doesn't mean anything, right? It's it's the only thing that can be selected. And then in this case, the confusion scroll is a slightly less than a third, presumably, or I guess maybe it'd be a quarter if it was, anyways, um, chance of being generated then the health potion and then you know as we keep adding things here basically the confusion scroll is the least likely which is kind of funny because i would imagine that the lightning scroll is actually the one that becomes more useful on the later dungeons so i imagine you probably want to make that a little more scarce but anyways um let's so anyways uh the, I'm, the one thing i'm not 100 percent clear on is how uh choice works from the uh from the random but essentially if I were presumably if I were to like look up the documentation, I would have a rough idea in terms of how I translate these into probabilities. And if not, I mean, there's a way you can just manually uh, turn these into into um, probabilities that are based on um, you know, zero to zero to one hundred or uh, zero to to one. And then obviously at that point you can just write your own choice the way that we've done for these other ones where you know you do if x is less than some value or something like that but we don't need to do that here all right enough talking let's see how close i was so we've got entity weighted chances there's an empty dictionary for key values in weighted chances by floor dot items if the key is greater than the floor break so presumably if I say else, it's going to complain about that. But value in values, entity is value zero. Yep. Weighted chance value one. Entity weighted chances entity equals weighted chance uh, let's actually talk about this so um, items basically gets me the key and the value which in this case would be the list um, from the the dictionary that I gave it so first of all if we're on a floor that we're not actually on get out of this loop right so if we're on the first floor we don't we don't care about um, we don't care about trolls uh, is the basic idea here. So it's like okay, well we potentially have a list right now with just single lists, so nothing too exciting here. But essentially we're unpacking these lists and we're adding them to our. Um... Oh, actually this is interesting. So for value and values, well it's a list of tuples, so entity and weighted chance. Okay, that's fine. So we're unpacking these. Um, So why couldn't I just do this? Um, so essentially, what we're doing is we're making a new we're making a new version of a of this um, this collection here, which again feels a little pointless because we only have uh, single items, but I, I kind of get why we're doing it this way because we're going to be adding more, more than one item later. Um, okay, so we've said, give me, you know, give me the stuff that I can pull and their chances up to the room that we have. So essentially what we're doing here is snipping this list uh, based on the floor. Now that we have this, um, entities is the list of um, entity weighted 
chances dot keys. Right, it doesn't return a key, it returns it returns a dict keys. Okay. So here's the things that you can get, the list of entities. Entity weighted values list. Um Okay, so look, I don't hate this, but if we're spending the time building up this dictionary by going through value and values, why not just put these into existing lists? So something like entities uh, weighted chance values And then something like um, something like that. I'm not going to do it. Like it's not. Um, it's not really something that I'm. I'm going to be up in arms about, I'm just, it feels like we're doing a little bit of work here to get something that we can get more directly. Uh, okay, so chosen entities, choices, okay, so random choices, uh, the population, this list of things that we can get, weights as a sequence of float or fraction, uh, returns a k-size list of population elements uh, chosen with replacement. If the relative weights or cumulative weights are not specified, the selections are made with equal probability. Yeah, well, that's fine. Uh, what I'm curious with, though, is like presumably these weights will just be converted into some kind of um, zero to one scale. Um, okay, so entities weights equals entity values and then k equals number of entities wait a minute where did i say where's number of entities oh no it's choosing k items of course um sorry again completely out to um completely out to lunch okay return chosen entities. So yeah, like I said, one sort of question I have, and this, like it's, it's, it's not a, this is not a really big deal, but the one thing I'm trying to get a little bit of a, a read on is what the benefit to um, this particular, um, this particular approach is, because it sort of feels like we take the time to build this dictionary of entity weighted chances, but in the end, we never use the dictionary. Uh, what we do is we use this dictionary as storage for a uh, we use this as storage for the uh, keys and values that will turn into these lists. And I mean, I suppose it's a way of enforcing, um, I guess it's a way of sort of enforcing that the entity and the weighted chance stay together. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I'm I'm not 100% sure Um if one is better than the other. I generally, I think it's safe to assume that if the tutorial is doing it, it's the better way, <laughs> but um, okay. And it's complaining about chosen entities, uh, unnecessary assignment to chosen entities before return. So is it just saying here, I should, um, I should just return Sure. Why not? Okay. We get the given number of entities for a Q 
infinite number of entities. Uh, that's too long, isn't it? All right. This function goes through the keys, floor numbers, and values, list of weighted entities stopping when the key is higher than the given floor number. It sets up a dictionary of weights for each entity based on which floor the player is currently on. So if we were trying to get the weights for floor 6, entity weighted chances would look like this, orc 80, troll 30. Then we get both the keys... oh, hang on. Okay, yeah, no, this still makes sense. So we're technically adding like three different trolls when we get to the maximum one, but they each have their own chance. So it's kind of the same as having a troll. So yeah, you don't, we don't need to worry about any of the calculations. Um, okay. Uh, then we get both the keys and values in the format so that they can be passed to random choices. Uh, it accepts choices and weights as lists. K represents the number of items that random choices should pick. So we can simply pass the number of entities that we've decided to generate. Finally, we return the list of chosen entities. Uh, putting this function to use is quite simple. In fact, it will reduce the amount of code in our place entities function quite nicely. So on to place entities. So we are going to add at the very, almost at the very top. Monsters is a list of entities. So get entities at random. And the chances, number of monsters, floor number, and then items, which is a list of entities, get entities at random, so in this case it would be item chances, number of items, and the floor number. Then we remove the range. So this is kind of neat, right? So we're saying, okay, so take each of the entities and monsters and items. So we're combining these two lists together. And we're saying, now just iterate over the individual entities because we've already sort of drawn the, um, we've already drawn the ones that we want. Complaining about a comma? Yeah. Um, I'm just trying to think. I don't know if that solves the, uh, I didn't, I didn't place you if there was something already there. No, it's still, we still have the not inside of that. But we definitely don't worry about this stuff anymore. Now place entities is just getting the amount of monsters and items to generate and leaving it up to get entities at random to determine which ones to create. With those changes, the dungeon will get progressively more difficult. You may want to tweak certain numbers like the strength of the enemies or how much health you recover with potions to get a more challenging experience. Our game is still not that difficult. If you increase your defense by just one, orcs are no longer a threat. Yeah, actually, this is kind of an interesting thing. Uh, as they, they point out, um, increasing the number of monsters isn't really all that different from what we did in the previous run where we just boosted up our defense until we um, we effectively ignored the enemy. So probably at some point we would want to create either more difficult enemies uh, or alternatively we would want to um, we would want to uh, um like boost the the stats uh, in the deeper dungeons. Okay, so before I run this thing, I do want to take a look and see if there's any problems of interest. 
Uh, let's not collapse that. So some of these I was ignoring, but um, trailing comma missing. Okay. That's everything, so let's see how this works. So here I'm continuing. We're already on to level seven. So I, I, this is just a nice opportunity for me to see how, presumably this level has already been generated, so we wouldn't worry about, um, or we wouldn't, um, we wouldn't see any of the new stuff that we've developed. And of course, we're already deep enough in the dungeon now that, um, we wouldn't see any changes in terms of the the generation but it at least lets me when i go to the next level it at least makes me sure that the generators are working when they have all the options It's not like I need the healing potions, but now, you know what? I got to confess, I'm not 100% sure how to move down. I think it's shift. Yes. Wow, that's a start. <laughs> um, so I guess at this point, we're boosting our strength. I think we one shot orcs now. Oh, inventory's full, so. No, not the health potion, damn it. <laughs> um. Definitely very active in the uh, lower levels. Like it feels like the rooms are pretty full. So we've got quite a few rooms with like two trolls in them, for instance, which of course makes sense because they've increased the number of enemies and the chance. Uh, I guess we boost our strength again. I guess the thing is, is that because trolls are worth so much more experience too, I imagine you start, I actually haven't worked out exactly how the leveling system works, but I have to imagine you start gaining levels pretty quickly too. So as long as you're able to sort of handle the trolls, um, you just become superhuman pretty quick. Which is fine, I hate losing. Um, that's why roguelikes are so suitable to me, right? <laughs> uh, okay. So as much as I'd love to save this uh, experience, I think the time has come for us to start from the beginning. So no warnings or anything like that. Um, I did want to go through at least generating one um, one level with the new parameters. Uh, we've got for proc gen, I think it was up to level four. No, it was up to level seven. Now I've already done level seven. Uh, I don't know if, what are we doing for time? I've already taken an hour on this. So I don't know if I um, 
can really justify trying to test every single new level, but let's at least try to get to level four to make sure that max items by four. I don't know, it'd be nice to see if it was at least noticeable. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> I'm hoping that going off, they do have a, a proper, um, I guess the cardioid pattern on the mic. Oh, that's interesting. So I pressed A a few times. And I'm glad I didn't boost my constitution, but um, makes me think that something's wrong on that. I guess I never really did test the leveling up. I'll try to boost. So that gives me a good reason to go to the, uh, the other levels. Um, just to test if the um, the leveling is working as intended. Okay, Oop. I have to go the long way. Okay, so if I press A for constitution, okay, invalid entry. We know B and C already work, so I'm going to take a look in... Actually, I guess I can do that now. Um, input handlers. Level up event handler. Aha. Huh. So there's the right values there. I'm sure I I'm the one who introduced this, but no, do you not let me? So why didn't my numpad work? Uh, okay. So I'm a little curious. That was my, my error. Now, I wish I knew Python well enough that I could predict whether or not changing that in the file would, um, like right now, would fix that while I'm running. I'm thinking it won't. Um, but I don't know that for sure. And we're on level three. So at this point, we might as well go a bit uh, deeper. One, because I want to provoke a level up, and two, because I want to... Um, I just kind of want to see the change.
first troll. Oh, and apparently it doesn't damage me, so we're already at immortality level. Yep, so invalid entry. Uh, at this point, we would increase strength. And we got a confusion scroll. So we've got everything that we need here. Okay, so I'm happy with where that is. I uh, probably took longer than I needed to, but uh, I do feel at least this time around I had... I have a little more to show for it just in terms of understanding. Um, so we're going to add and... Okay. 12... Okay, so we won't sync until we finish the session, but I'm going to move on to the next part. So this, I believe, is the last part of the tutorial proper. And then all of the remaining time will be spent on sort of implementing new things. And I'll Maybe if I have the time, I'll try and talk about that at the very end. Um, but, um, but yeah, I, there's no point in, in rushing uh, that part. This is, that's arguably the fun part. Hang on. Why are you mad? Weird. Might as well take the time to um, I'm gonna take the time to just fix at least some of these. Okay, on to the last part of the tutorial, gearing up. For the final part of this tutorial, we will implement something most roguelikes have, equipment. Our implementation will be extremely simple. Equipping a weapon increases attack power and equipping armor increases defense. Many roguelikes have more equipment types than just these two and the effects of equipment can go much further than this, but this should be enough to get you started. First, we'll want to define the types of equipment that can be found in the dungeon. As with render or the render order class, we can use enum to define types. For now, we'll leave it at weapons and armor, but feel free to add more types as you see fit. Create a new file, equipmenttypes.py, and put the following contents in it. Ah. All right, from enum import auto enum class equipment type enum weapon auto already it doesn't like what we've done. <laughs> Missing doc string import block is unsorted or unformat. Okay. <laughs> oh, fair enough. Okay. 
Um, yeah, missing doc strings. I'm going to learn to live with that. Now it's time to create the component that will attach to the equipment. We'll call the component equipable, which will have a few different attributes. Equipment type, the type of equipment using the equipment type enum. Power bonus, how much the wielder's attack power will be increased, currently used for just weapons. Defense bonus, how much the wearer's defense will be increased, currently just for armor. Create the file equipable.py in the components directory and fill it with the following. Okay, from future imports annotations, from typing import type checking, from components base components import base components, from equipment types. Good God. Import equipment. This is much like uh, any of the other components that we've put in. We first defining the equipable class. We define our old friend in it. Equipment type is an equipment type. It's going to want a doc string, so. Yep. Dagger. So this is presumably where we're uh, act making the sorts of things that we can use in the game. Callus, huh? I wonder why this gets a none and this one doesn't. Missing here. Okay, this is how it should be.
Okay, leather armor gives us a defense of one. That seems pretty strong against orcs already. Um, Why don't you like this name? Missing Dock String. Right, because the class and the. Um, Chainmail. Nope. <laughs> All right, here we go. So get rid of that. Give it a defense bonus, tell it that it's armor, and we're good. Wait, I said four, it should be three. Okay, aside from creating the equipable class as described earlier, we've also created a few types of equipment, comp uh, sorry, equipable components for each equipable entity we'll end up creating similar to what we did with the consumable classes. You don't have to do this, uh, do it this way. You could just define these when creating the entities, but you might want to add additional functionality to weapons and armor at some point, and defining the equipable classes this way might make that easier. You might also want to move these classes to their own file, but that's outside the scope of this tutorial. To create the actual equipable entities, we'll want to adjust our item class. We can use the same class that we used for our consumables and just handle them slightly differently. Another approach would be to create another subclass of entity, but for the sake of keeping the number of entity subclasses in the tutorial short, we'll adjust item. Make the following adjustments to entity.py. Okay, so after consumable, from components, equipable, for equipable, and then item. I need to remember to apply that to a couple of these other ones too. Uh, okay, where were we? Um, class item. So for this, we want to get rid of consumable and replace that with, uh, I don't think we do optional consumable anymore. I think in this case we do uh, consumable or none. And then equipable. Again, is equipable or none, and add the trailing comma. Okay, so equipable isn't currently used right now. Um, we initialize it with self-consumable. All right, here we go. If self-consumable self consumable parent equals self self equipable it's 
It's weird that that didn't auto... First of all, equipable is just a very unusual looking um, word. So E-Q-U-I-P-P-A-B-L-E. Uh, okay, so that's in the init for entity. So there's no complaints there. It's complaining that it's not accessed, which does worry me a little bit. So while we're initializing, we call init. We have our X, Y, character color, name. All of these things are set, which is fine. So then we say self-consumable equals consumable. Self-equipable found a useless... Ex okay, right. So it's complaining because we haven't completed the job yet. So equipable. Of course, right. Sorry. So the self dot shouldn't uh, auto... Uh, auto uh, sorry, shouldn't be detected, but the, uh, the equipable itself should be. Okay, my bad. If self equipable... Um, it's basically the same thing as the consumable. <clears throat> All right, we've added equipable as an optional component for the item class and also made consumable optional so that not all item instances will be consumable. Because consumable is now an optional attribute, we need to adjust actions.py to take this into account. Uh, so this is going to be under item action and under perform. Invoke the item's ability. This action will be given to provide context. Apparently, maybe it was because it was too long. Yeah. So just add the condition, can I consume you? If so, um, consume. In order to actually create the equipable entities, we'll want to add a few examples to entityfactories.py. The entities we will add correspond to the equipable subclasses we already made. Edit ent entity factories like this. Okay, so... Um, from components, AI, hostile enemy. After that, from components, import, consumable, equipable. Why would I do that? I think it's already organized them for me, so just add. Presumably from there, I'll not get as many complaints. After the lightning scroll, we will add dagger is an item. Taking it for its word that this is a good color. So daggers and swords look the same in this game. Oh, no, they don't because they probably have different colors. Nope. <laughs> same character for both. Or same icon for both, I guess. Other armor item. But if I use the left bracket, however, will I use the shield? Okay, um, so once a trailing comma, no doubt.
actually it doesn't like that because it's too long so I'll just give you your own line All right, that just weirds me out. Oh, right, because it that doesn't weird me out so much anymore. Um, the creation of these entities is very similar to consumables, except that we give them the equipable component instead of consumable. This is all we need to do to create the entities themselves, but we're far from finished. We still need to make these entities appear on the map, make them equipable, there's nothing for them to attach to on the player right now, and make equipping them actually do something. To handle the equipment that the player has equipped at the moment, we can create yet another component to handle the players, or the monsters for that matter, equipment. Create a new file called equipment.py in the components folder and add these contents. Sorry, new file. Future import annotations, our old friend. Uh, we won't, don't import optional, but we do import type checking. Components, base component, import base. Equipment uh, inherits from base components. Parent is the actor or an actor. Uh, old friend init. Item or none. Or none. I know I'm supposed to do the doc strings, but I'm just going to skip over those right now. Okay, so starts with a defense bonus of zero. If self weapon is not none. So shouldn't it just be if self weapon? Because if it has a zero, which would produce a false here, it doesn't really matter, does it? Um, and self weapon equipable is not none. All right, so if they're both not none, um, bonus. Yeah, you know what? I'm going to go rogue here. Okay, I'm I'm completely lost here. So if self weapon is not none and self weapon equipable is not none, self weapon equipable dot defense bonus. Okay, no no no, I get it. Right. So we're allowing that in future there may be weapons that actually give us defensive bonuses as well. It's like a sword with an absolutely a massive massive um is it the pommel? I feel like the pommel. Yeah, I think it's the pommel. Pommel's the end. Um, this is the cross guard. But if it's not, if it's... um. A foil and it's got the it doesn't have a um, 
a crossbar, what would it be called? Pommel grip rain guard. Bell guard. Massive bell guard on the uh, the sword. And I hear you say, System Chalk, why did you waste your time looking for the definition of a sword part? It's research. We have to create verisimilitude in our uh, roguelike games. How can you be expected to create a believable dungeon if you don't know the parts of a weapon? Uh, one reason I'm doing it this way, so it could be, as has usually been the case with this tutorial, uh, when I feel that I can take a shortcut or I can simplify things, usually I wind up learning um, that their method was appropriate. And so in this particular case, uh, I'm doing this because I can't off the top of my head think of a good reason why this shouldn't be okay to do. Um, so uh, we'll say self-weapon is not none. I, I, maybe I should take the time to explain the, the reasoning here. So we've got a self-weapon, right? Now, a self-weapon can be... Um, oh, here's the question. So what could it be? Well, it could be an item or it could be a none. So if it's none, what does it? what's its truth value? It's false. And if it's an item, well, if it's an item, then it's, um, it's true. Um, so it would seem to me that saying not none is the same as saying if it is an item. Um, likewise, we say, okay, so the weapon exists. Is the weapon equipable? What are the possible states for weapon equipable? Um, I'm curious, actually, if we... Right, that would have to be on item. So yeah, so an equipable is either an equipable or none, initializes to none. So again, either you are a thing or you're a none, and if you're a none, then this is false. So from there, we know that equipables have a default defense bonus of zero which means that we're not going to get an error when we get into a uh, bonus. Okay. Makes sense. So uh, we have an item is the is the the item that I so basically I need to check my armor and I need to check my weapon. If either of those items are the item that I have, then it's equipped. Um, fairly self-explanatory way of defining whether or not something I have is equipped. Uh, def unequip. Message self item name is a string none.
you equip the name. Okay, so this, again, these are just messages to the player, so um, not a whole lot to go with in here. Def equip to slot self slot str item item add message rule none. So I think this is the actual applying the item to our character here. Current item let's get attr self slot. Why do we call get attr? Get a named attribute from an object. Get attr x y is equivalent to x dot y. Okay, so we're taking from self self dot slot. So we're in equipment, but we don't have a slot, do we? Um, hmm. Unless it's just pulling out the argument, but then I don't think I quite understand why we're doing this. Let's run with it and see if I can figure out if current item, okay, if current item, self unequip, slot, slot, add message. So if you are equipable, and equipable item, role type equals, and type weapon, double equals. This is too long. How the hell do I deal with this? Uh, okay, so we've got our condition lot equals weapon, otherwise it defaults to armor.
Okay, sorry, a lot of right typing and silence there. Uh, so, didn't like the item, probably because it needs a capital letter. Um, probably a lot of complaints about doc strings. I've got a line that's too long. Um, okay. Uh, the slot thing I'm a little iffy about. Boolean type positional argument in function definite. I think we solved this last time just by adding a star or a splat or whatever it is. Oh, didn't like that. Um, setting merging multiple comparisons in if. Maybe it would be better for me to handle these um, after I know what they do. Okay, uh, let's see what the tutorial has to say because there's definitely a couple of things where, like I, I kind of feel like I have a bit of an idea in terms of uh, what get ATTR and set ATTR do on their own. I'm not 100% sure how they relate to this concept of slot. Because um, like normally when I think of something like a slot, I'm like, okay, well, this would be, you know, something, you know, maybe a class, maybe a component. Um, and that kind of is what's happening here, but it's not quite the same as, as normally when we've added no, new stuff to, to characters. So I'm sure this makes sense. It's just, I, it does not make sense to me, which is the, the key. Unfortunately, this tutorial is going to have to, to deal with um, the limitations of its audience, uh, which in my, my case are substantial. So this is a lot to take in. Let's go through it bit by bit. So we're defining the class equipment and it inherits from base component. We say that the parent is an actor and we, when we use init, we give it a optional weapon uh, and armor. Uh, the weapon and armor attributes are what will hold the actual equipable entity. So both can be set to none, which represents nothing equipped in those slots. Uh, feel free to add more slots as you see fit. Perhaps you want armor to be head, body, legs, etc., instead of allow for offhand weapons uh, or allow for offhand weapons slash shields. Okay, so now we have the property of the defense bonus, which in this case here, we just take a look at what the different, um, the different items give us and return the, uh, the sum of all of their defense bonuses. Same with power. These properties do the same thing, just for different things. Both calculate the bonus gifted by equipment to either defense or power based on what's equipped. Notice that we take the power bonus from both weapons and armor, and the same applies to the defense bonus. This allows you to create weapons that increase both attack and defense, maybe some sort of spiked shield, and armor that increases attack, something magical maybe. We won't do that in this tutorial. Weapons will only increase power, army will, armor will only increase defense, but you should experiment with different equipment types on your own. So, you know, that was a point of confusion for me originally, but we were able to sort of work our way through that. Um, Define item is equipped. Again, see if the item in question is already in the slot. This allows us to quickly check if an item is equipped by the player or not. This will come in handy later on. Uh, the equip and unequip messages, both of these method methods add a message to the message log depending on whether the player is equipping or removing a piece of equipment. Okay, so equip to slot and unequip from slot. This is where I sort of tripped, uh, tripped up specifically because of this. So equip to slot and unequip to slot uh, with add or remove, I think it says will, it meant to say will, uh, with add or remove an item to a given quote unquote slot, weapon or armor. Oh, hang on, I get it now. So, right, okay. So the reason why this doesn't work, remember how it said this is equivalent to like x dot y. So we have defined, um, I should just be using this in the equipable or equipment. 
So it's this, yeah, so it's weapon or armor. So we say uh, weapon. So I kind of feel like in this case here, probably it should be something like, I don't know if this actually works for type hinting. Yeah, you can't, you can't actually define literals. Um, so yeah, it can be a string, but the only meaningful strings in these cases are actually the ones that correspond to uh, weapon or armor. This is, this is where I, so the, the part where I got confused is that I was trying to reconcile this concept of a slot with a string. And the, tr the trick here is that it's not natural to think of these as strings. It's natural to think of them as your, your inventory slots, basically. And of course, it is called slot. It's just, you know, again, when you see a definition string, it's like, I'm, I'm trying to... So, this is this was where I got tripped up as I, I was too hung up on the string and I wasn't I wasn't thinking far enough ahead as far as how how this works. And I think probably if I'd pay so I paid attention to this thing here. What I didn't pay attention to was this little signature uh, up here and the fact that this the string is actually a rather important part of the uh, the equation. So anyways, that's fine. We've got it now. So we use uh, get at, uh, attr to or get attribute to get the slot, whether it's weapon or armor. We use get at, uh, attribute because we won't actually know which one we're getting until the function is called. Uh, get attribute uh, allows us to get an attribute on a class self in this case and do what we want with it. We use set attribute to set the attribute the same way. Unequip some, from slot simply removes the item. Equip to slot first checks if there's something equipped to that slot and calls unequip from slot if there is. This way, the player can't equip two things to the same slot. What's with the add message part? Normally, we'll want to add a message to the message log when we equip slash remove things. But in this section, we'll see an exception. When we set up the player's initial equipment, uh, we'll use the same equip methods to set up the initial equipment. But there's no need to begin every game with messages that say that the player uh, put on their starting equipment. Presumably, the player character did this before walking into the deadly dungeon. Add message gives us a simple way not to add the messages if they aren't necessary. In your game, there might be other scenarios where you don't want to display these messages. Toggle equip. Uh, so let's just take a look at the logic behind this again, see if now the new information. Okay, so we have an equipable item. Um, if the equipable item is equipable, um, and the equipable item is a weapon, Okay, then the slot is weapon, else it's armor. Um, right. So if there's already an equipable item in there, unequip. Hang on. This might be related to when we push the button. Um, this feels like I'm just removing something without actually replacing it. Finally, we have the toggle equip, which is the method that will actually get called when the player selects an equipable item. It checks that the equipment's type to know. Uh, it checks the equipment's type to know which slot to put it in, and then checks to see if the same item is already equipped to the slot. If it is, the player presumably wants to remove it. If not, the player wants to equip it. To sum up, this component holds references to equipable entities, calculates the bonuses the player gets from them, which will get added to the player's power and defense values, and gives a way to equip or remove the items. Let's add the component to the actors now, entity.py, uh, entity to add, and add these lines. Okay. All right, so we're type checking consumable from component. Oh, good lord. Equipment support equipment. Um, oh, we need actor. Uh, 
after AI, we define Okay. We also need to update entity factories.py once again to create actors with the equipment component. So the actor after AICLS. And then the orc. And then the troll. I never remember to add the commas. Okay, one thing we need to do is change the way power and defense are calculated in the fighter component. Currently, the values are set directly in the class, but we'll want to calculate them based on their base values, what gets leveled up, and the bonus values based on equipment. We can redefine power and defense as properties and rename what we set in the class to base power and base defense. Power and Defense will then get their values from their respective bases and equipment bonuses. This will require edits to several places, but we'll fir uh, start first with the most obvious, the fighter class itself. Uh, we're in Entity Factories. Um, okay, I don't think we have that open actually. Okay, so we've got the fighter base component. We are going to change defense to base defense and power to base power. After setter, we will set some properties. So I'm not sure where bonus comes from. Oh, we define that later, okay. Uh, def power self int turn self base power plus self power bonus property def defense bonus self turns an int self parent equipment and then presumably that's the same I could scroll down but I'm gonna guess it's the same for power Power and defense are now computed based on the base values and the bonus values offered by the equipment, if any exists. And we, the, it complained about the else, which of course makes sense. If you have equipment, you return the defense bonus. Otherwise, you return zero. You don't need to say else. Um, we'll need to edit the level.py to reflect the new attribute names as well. Okay, so inside level, we are changing increase power. Okay, so that's base. And then adjust the initializations in entity factories.
I don't know if I should have done it that way, but it seems to have worked out. Notice that we've changed uh, the player's base values a bit. This is too com Oh, hang on. Did we change the place? No, I got lazy. So yeah, this makes sense. The dagger has one base power, two. So the leather, I think the leather was three, was it? Actually, it's probably lower. And those are inequipable, so I won't know anyway. That's fine. It'll be a mystery. Uh, okay, so one and two, uh, zero and three for the orc, and one and four for the troll, so that's fine. Um, notice that we've changed the player's base values a bit. This is to compensate for the fact that the player will be getting bonuses from equipment soon. Feel free to tweak these values however you see fit. Now all that's left to do is uh, allow generate the uh, okay. We're generating equipment on the map, and allow the player to interact with it. To create equipment, we can simply edit our item chances uh, dictionary to include weapons and armor on certain floors. Edit procgen.py like this. We're looking for item chances on level four. We want to start getting swords. It's actually kind of interesting that the chainmail is more likely than the sword because the chainmail is the sort of thing that can make the game. Uh, a bit broken in the sense that the trolls and orcs can't really hurt you. Uh, this will generate swords and chainmail at levels four and six respectively. You can change the floor uh, or the weights if you like. Now that the equipment will spawn on the map, we need to allow the user to equip and remove equipable entities. The first step is to add an action to equip things, which we will call equip action. Add this class to actions.py. So after drop item, oh, we're already there. Class equip action action def init self entity actor item item super init entity item item. Then we need to define perform, def perform self produces none, self entity equipment toggle equip. Okay. And we already, um, basically, we already did all the heavy lifting in terms of how that's actually implemented before. The action itself is very straightforward. It holds which item is being equipped slash removed and calls the toggle equip method. The equipment component handles most of the work here. But how do we use this action? The simplest way would be to expand the functionality of our original inventory menu. If the user selects a piece of equipment from that menu, we'll either equip the item or remove it if it's already equipped. We should also show the user a visual representation of which items are already equipped. Modify input handlers.py like this. Uh, this is inventory event handler. Blah. Okay, uh, if number of item, so this is on render. If number of items in inventory is greater than zero, we remove the cons, well, we don't really remove the, well, yeah, we kind of do. Let's just get rid of that. Uh, is equipped item string equals f item key item name. If it is equipped, string equal 
item string e so originally i wanted to um uh, originally i was just going to move this down but i realized that item key item name is now in item string so And inventory activate handler is where? Sorry. Um, okay, so if it's a consumable item, turn the action for the selected. if it's equipable and then it'll complain about the uh, else so I'll just return none otherwise okay so you don't like else if right Uh, the first change is modifying the render function to display an E next to items that are equipped. Items that aren't equipped are displayed the same way as before. The second change has to do with using the item. Before, we were just assuming the item was a consumable. Now, if the item is a consumable, we call the getAction method on the consumable component just like before. If it's instead equipable, we call the equip action. If it's neither, nothing happens. Run the game now. You'll be able to pick up and equip things. I recommend adjusting the values in procgen.py to make equipment spawn earlier and more often just for testing purposes. Uh, if you play around a bit, you might notice an odd bug. If a player drops something that's equipped, it stays equipped. <laughs> that doesn't make sense, as dropping something should unequip it as well. Luckily, the fix is quite simple. We can adjust our drop item action to unequip an item if it's being dropped and if it's equipped. Um, Make the following additions to actions.py. Now, obviously, we didn't run the game, but um, I got ahead of myself. Okay, so we start with if self entity equipment item is equipped. and then remove it. Um, okay, so it did say we can run around in the environment. It does say we're gonna be spawning with a dagger and leather, but let's actually start. Um, oh boy, that's a lot more problems than I remember. <laughs> let's take a quick look before we go too far in. So actions, bunch of missing doc strings for enough. Consider merging the comparisons. I think we're gonna leave that for later. Um, replace the if, right. Sorry, I'm just not. I'm not uh, thinking sensibly. Uh, new H, actually, you know what? <laughs> I don't even need to think sensibly. I could just use the... Okay, I can live with these. So uh, let's go to main. Let's see if this thing runs. No. <laughs> so it doesn't like equipment. Equipment requires two positional arguments. Now I don't think 
Yeah, so it likes this. These can be none. Oh, did I forget a default maybe? That's exactly what I forgot. And now it's too long, so we'll just change this all up. That's sufficient. I don't, it looks kind of ugly to be honest, but uh, okay. That might be all I need, but let's see. Okay, no errors. So we're gonna play this for a little bit. Oh, didn't like that. Okay, so you did not like under actions. Okay, so I'm performing the action, damage, self, entity, fighter, power. Ah, so it needs to be base power. Oh. Uh, makes me think that something went wrong. I guess it has to be under fighter, so... Well, this is interesting. Okay, so we've got a property called power, self entity fighter power. Um, oh, I think I know. So, right. So it says here int and method, and I think I need to add a couple of uh, parentheses around that. Uh, let's double check. Defense bonus, power bonus, where is the... It's all well and good for me to guess this stuff, but what I do want to make sure is that my... So it's nice to come up with a hypothesis in terms of what the problem is. And I mean, again, it's the Python error messages are really nice. Um, they, you know, tell you what's going wrong and offer you a cup of tea, but um, I do... Nope, that... So the tutorial seems to think that I should be able to do return self base power plus self power bonus. Um, so power bonus, ah, I didn't define power bonus as a property. That's the problem. Still doesn't like that. All right. Equipment project uh, object has no power bonus. How much you want to bet that's me doing the... Uh... Hmm. Did I really forget to implement <laughs> power bonus? It looks like I did. All right, well, it's nice that that's an easy fix.
All right, that wasn't too painful. Uh, let's get out of this. Once more with feeling. That took a lot more effort to take out the orc, I notice. So I may want to... Oh, it's probably because I don't already have the um, dagger. Yeah, so I'm basically attacking stuff with my bare fists. I actually kind of like this, to be honest. I don't think I'll survive, but... Okay, so this is definitely death if I stick around. Which is actually a fun little bit of tension. Um, so this starting area really just gives me health, but I actually want to sort of give the enemies the slip. Um, of course, if I do that, I potentially... Um, I don't give myself the experience that will let me win. I'm so dead. All right. Uh, cool. So that, I mean, so that's probably too hard, but there's actually something kind of fun about that really desperate start. This is something I want to kind of keep in mind as I... Um, Actually, you know, we should probably try this again. Let's try and at least get to a piece of equipment. So, um, it's kind of like a battle royale, I guess, where you're scrambling to get equipment uh, early on. Ah, <laughs> it's really hoping. I could snag a potion and run away. Okay, so there's definitely a potion there, but I gotta... Yeah, actually, this is a really neat way to start. So, like, in this case, I have to rely a little bit more on being sort of sneaky and um, finding... Again, I don't know if this is the way I would want to start off a game like this, um, just because it does seem really difficult. Okay, so I, I have to fight here. Oh, I think I'm dead. Oops, sorry, I didn't mean to rage quit. Um, good lord, what an opener. beat the crap out of me all the way through the dungeon. <laughs> I guess I have to quit each time I die. Um... Oh no! <laughs> this is horrifying. Um, Yeah, so you can't exactly run for your life, but you can't stand and fight either. All right, um, let's do what the rest of the tutorial says, and we'll practice with the equipment. Um, 
We'll practice with the equipment after. Uh, so. Uh, one last thing we can do is give the player a bit of equipment to start. We'll spawn a dagger and leather armor and immediately add them to the player's inventory. Um, uh, where were we? Okay, we're making a new game. Or I guess there's a setup, isn't there? Dagger, copy, deep copy, entity, factories, dot dagger. There. Okay. Your parent player dot inventory. You know, the more I think about the parent bits, the more I think I would sort of fail a quiz on those. So that's maybe something I should spend some time thinking about uh, in between episodes. So player, inventory, items, pend, dagger, equipment, toggle, equip, dagger, message, false. Why am I comma? Uh, ba -ba -ba. Player, inventory, items, append, leather, armor. No comma. And player, inventory, nope, player, equipment, toggle, equip. Leather armor, add message, false. And then we return the engine. Uh, as mentioned earlier, we pass uh, add message false to signify not to add a message to the message log. Okay, so it hasn't complained yet. Oh, <laughs> yes, I did mean equipable. Uh, where was the complaint? In new game, toggle, equip. We would have found that if I didn't die so often in the game. Uh, okay. So we know that the dagger and leather armor is working now. Uh, what I'm going to do here is fight the um, orcs. So if I, aha. Takes two positional arguments, but three were given. Um, Three were given. How are three given if I am calling? So I'm giving it slot and add message. I'm not going to lie, this doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. Probably. No module name components. I 
I kind of get why. I think this is specifically because I ran this instead of main. All right. You remove the dagger. You equip the dagger. Drop the dagger. You have dropped the dagger. You pick up the dagger. You equip the dagger. OK. Right now, I just kind of want to see how this plays a bit. I think we're at the end, but... Just taking a minute to see if there's anything scary. I'm sure I'd see it with like the red text, but... Okay, let's go back and see what that room looks like. I'm assuming there's nothing special in there, but... Oh, that's why we check. Okay, um, less than half our health on the first level, exciting. Let's do, so I should test constitution. Yeah, I'll add constitution. It feels a little weird to do that, but. Um, I really wanted to make sure that that was working. Otherwise it would have been defense. Although, to be honest, another 20 health points uh, in these early stages is not too bad. So there may be an argument that because you can get the chain mail later, it might be better to just buff up your health. Yeah, actually, that's going to be an interesting one for me. So if I think of the amount of health I need to spend to take out orcs, yikes. I'm dead. All right, cool. Um, it's actually kind of neat to see that this is a dungeon that I used to sort of cruise through, and now I, I have yet to actually successfully uh, find a single item. But I don't feel like this is the sort of thing I should subject people to on the stream quite a bit because I have a feeling a lot of this will relate to whatever extensions we wind up doing. With that, we have reached the end of the tutorial. Thank you so much for following along and be sure to check out the extras section. More will be added there over time. If you have a suggestion for an extra, let me know. Be sure to check out the roguelike development subreddit for help, for inspiration, or to share your progress. Best of luck on your roguelike development journey. If you want to see the code so far in its entirety, click here. We're going to go to the extra section because I don't, I know I'm at sort of the two hour mark, which is where it normally would be. So I'm going to take some time. First of all, I want to take a look at the extra section. Uh, we're going to spend some time to just sort of clean up. Right now we've got 115 problems. So what I might do is I will address these, commit, and then I might actually kind of go file by file just to you know, get this in the like, okay, let's try and make Ruff as happy as we can get. 
uh, and then we'll talk a little bit about what the extensions might be. Uh, that's going to be a whole separate uh, entry. But in this case here, I think it might be uh, a little interesting to um, to run through. Actually, you know what? Let's change the order a little bit. So first of all, let's take a look at the problems. So in actions, uh, a lot of missing doc strings. Um, okay, we can definitely fix that. Okay, so I wonder, can you quick fix this? Oh yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I like that actually. Uh, this might cause problems. What am I thinking? This should be sufficient, shouldn't it? Okay, so equip to slot is going to have some sort of complaint. Um, yeah. Hopefully that anticipates that problem. Okay, um, so in actions, a lot of missing doc strings. We'll ignore those. Uh, equipment, again, doc strings will handle later. Doesn't like the lack of trailing comma, so we'll add that there. Okay, to equipable doc strings, again, that's a lot for me to do at some future point. Um, input handlers, it still doesn't like the assert, unused method argument event, uh, but that's fine because we're implementing something else. Um, we ignored the magic values, that's something we'll deal with later. Um, key down's too complex. I think for these we just said we we're going to ignore them. Okay, so the rest of these are sort of known uh, known issues. So uh, what we're going to do first is we will commit the um, uh, the changes that we made to up to uh, part thirteen.
and we'll commit and sync this time because I don't think we're going to be doing anything else. Okay. So having, oh, sorry, there was another thing I was going to do. So um, there may be one more sync. So net.py doesn't like the doc string. AI doc strings doesn't like the pseudo random numbers. That's fine. Base components, doc strings, consumable. Okay, 12 complaints, all about doc strings. Equipment, um, again, all doc strings. Equipable, doc strings. Fighter, doc strings. Inventory, doc strings. Level, doc strings. Actions, doc strings. Color, doc strings. Engine, doc strings. Entity factories, doc strings, or doc string. Uh, doc strings, equipment types, doc strings. Exceptions, doc string. Game okay, map, doc string. Input handlers, uh, we've got one assert, but we said we're okay with that. Unused method arguments are going to come up a lot, I think. Uh, magic value comparison. Again, a lot of these things will be things that we handle later, but I'm living with right now. Um, okay. Main doesn't like the print. Doc strings don't catch blind exceptions. Message log, doc strings. Proc gen, uh, doc strings, random numbers, magic values. Okay. Render functions, doc strings, render order, doc strings, setup game, doesn't like the pickle, doesn't like the assert, doc string, and don't catch blind exception. And finally, tile types, doesn't like the missing doc string. Okay, so this was just to, um, this is just to make sure that there wasn't anything that, and basically I wanted to get rid of anything that was, um, outstanding as a error that I'd agreed to handle before. It's a lot of doc strings that I'm going to have to deal with. I think I'm also going to rewrite the ones that I've already written, um, but I'm going to do that with like the pep, like open and sort of really thinking about one, what the functions, the classes, like essentially to, to write the doc strings in line with what the expectations are. Um, because really at this point, I should understand what this program is doing. I should understand what a doc string is. And I imagine one way I will get better at writing doc strings is to actually go through and fix all of this stuff to make sure that it is sort of the stuff I would like to see if I was um, if I was coming to this program, you know, without any prior knowledge. Okay, so again, I've I have my um, sort of my to-do list for a future uh, Future set. I don't know if I'll do these as sort of the extensions because I, you know, time is precious for those. But let's go to extras. So this right now just has a more traditional look. Um, so extra, a more traditional look. Prerequisites, completion of part four. The tutorial itself goes in a much different visual direction than most roguelikes. If you take a, uh, if you like this look, great. If you want to make your game look a bit more like other roguelikes you might be more familiar with, this section is for you. So. With all respect to people who uh, decide to go down this path, I actually am in that first category of people who like um, the look. So my general view is that I understand that the roguelike is something of a backward looking genre. There's a certain degree of nostalgia. There's a certain degree of, you know, wanting to learn and sort of pick up from what came before. But uh, I do... I do tend to like, um, I don't know, looking looking forward, right? So uh, when it comes to traditional roguelike looks and the idea that they, um, you know, they're they're facing certain constraints with their, um, yeah, you know, with their technology. Um, I think the way this tutorial has been set up is more in line with what my particular interests are. Um, I think you can sort of get the feeling of playing a roguelike. 
but not feeling the need that you have to have a visual style that's equal to it. Again, obviously people will have, have different views on that, but for me, I, I'm probably not going to do this, but I would like to read it nonetheless. Um, so, most roguelikes define floor tiles as a period and the wall tiles as a pound sign. This is simple enough to implement by adjusting our tile types like this. Uh, note that if you haven't completed part 11 yet, just ignore the downstairs tile type. Uh, that, actually, this doesn't look too bad, to be honest, but I, I, still, I think I still prefer the, um, the old-fashioned look. There is something kind of nice about some of the colors and, and all of that. So I could actually, one thing that could convince me about this is if you could, so I don't know if color was something you could rely on. I think one thing that could convince me on this extension is if I found an interesting way to take the convention of the old style roguelike and to use, you know, use something like the contrast between the very black and white environment um, to highlight some of the other stuff in the level. I think that would actually be something kind of interesting, but I'm not, uh, unless I have a specific idea along those lines, I think I'm going to stick with what the tutorial gave me. Uh, the tile types are now represented by periods and octothorps, <laughs> or hash or pound symbols, uh, and the colors are a lighter gray if the tile is in the field of view and darker gray if it's outside of it. After these changes, the game will look like this. Note screenshot taken from a different version of the game after part 13. You should experiment with different looks for your games based on what you think is visually appealing. Adjust the colors, change symbols, and modify the UI to your heart's content. So that, as far as I can tell in this version of the tutorial, keeping in mind that there are different versions, and I think there's also one that was hosted on a different site. I'm pretty sure it's somewhere in the, um, somewhere in, in these areas here. Um, a rogue basin, I think it was, but, um, yeah, I'm, I'm sticking with this one here. So, uh, that's kind of it for the extras that have been listed to this tutorial right now. I imagine that if you look at what the other people are doing, there's probably quite a bit, uh, to go with there, but maybe that isn't where I want to, I don't know. I feel like it, the, the joy of this is going to be looking at everybody's roguelikes at the conclusion rather than like looking at other people's homeworks or homework and trying to, you know, try to implement their own stuff. So I don't know, for my part, um, I think I want to, I think I'm going to have a, a think in terms of what I want to do as far as, um, as far as implementing in the game. So there are a few, as far as the basics of the game that we currently have right now, there are a few sort of obvious steps. So one option is always adding more, right? So, you know, more enemies, more equipment, etc., etc. That may not be the most rewarding uh, experience though, right? Because in the end, all that I'm really doing is taking that, uh, taking that small, taking that one lesson that I have of like, here's how you implement an orc. Here's how you implement a troll. What do I really learn about that by adding another one? I might learn something along the lines of balance, but if I'm trying to learn balance, is it really that much easier for me to get a clear understanding of what I'm doing if I'm now keeping track of three or four different enemy types rather than this small number here? So adding more is definitely an easy option, but I'm not entirely sure that is going to be the most rewarding. So one thing in terms of balance uh, that I can work out is to just go through the levels a few times and say, why am I seeing the outcomes that I am? And what are some of the things that I can do differently? So for instance, I thought there was something really, really interesting about that initial mad scramble at the beginning of the game to try and find a weapon. And the way that it was set up originally was too tough, right? Like that one is really just a, you know, that, that one is, uh, people will stop playing that because they just die too many times and it really feels like, some runs are doomed to failure no matter what. But I can definitely see how giving people a very tough set of conditions at the beginning, essentially ones that you you are on a very clear timer if you don't find some equipment to work with. I actually think there's something kind of interesting in that. And I think that I think there's something that we can work with there. 
Um, so your first your first move is not necessarily going and buffing yourself up. Your first move is making sure that you can survive, and that means you don't necessarily want to clear every every floor. Once you are now equipped, now you start taking your revenge on the enemy. And I actually kind of like that idea too, because there's this idea that you know you start off and you you know your your leg is already in the bear trap, and this is horrible, but like you're 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 extracting yourself from this horrible situation and then the game sort of gives you a little bit of an apology and says, okay, now you get to kick some ass or something like that. Um, so this being able to think a little bit about how I manipulate the game so that I'm not hard coding in the, like, so I don't want to have like an initial level that always has like a dagger behind an orc or something like that. I want to try and build it so that you have that sense of desperation at the beginning. And again, I'm, I'm free associating here. I may have a different feeling by the end, but uh, this idea of sort of a mad scramble to get yourself equipped at the very opening where you really do feel like there is a countdown that you need to um, that you need to um, to sort of overcome. You need to defuse the bomb or whatever of of the of being overwhelmed by the enemies. And then you can start focusing on um, improving your character. I think I think there's something interesting there and it's something I'd like to explore. Um, there are definitely some things that can be implemented. So right now we just keep going down and down and down. And um, Eric's game, Into Ruins, actually does that. It's getting the wings of Yendor that cause you to, that allow you to move up. So I do, there is something about um, Eric's, uh, Eric's game that I think tells me that you don't actually have to do the stairs up. But I think the stairs up might be something interesting to try and implement um, because it's it's a little along the line. So if you think of what the tutorial is trying to teach and what you might want to try and learn, being able to say, OK, we've implemented one direction uh, in terms of where you go. But we haven't implemented the the reverse, right? We haven't allowed you to go back up levels. Um, that strikes me as one of these cases where it's like, okay, so did you follow the tutorial well enough that you're going to be able to to do this next, um, you know, this next step? Uh, what else? There's actually a few. There's definitely a couple of ideas of things that I had over the course of uh, doing this tutorial. They're definitely very fun ones, um, but I wanted to do like a proper brainstorming. Um, episode where I sort of talk about some of the ideas and specifically saying which ones are things that I can implement over time. And I, I realize this video is getting a bit long, so I think I'm going to leave it here. Um, so just a quick recap of some of the ideas that I have. I think I'm going to, on my own time, do like the doc strings and the, like basically, I, I if I can, I'd like to get this so that rough is, its complaints are down to zero. Um, and I realize I'm sort of cheating by like getting rid of the complexity ones, but um, this seems like a a worthwhile um, a worthwhile exercise. But I can just do that on my own time. That's not going to be um, that's not going to have to be something that I subject all of you to. There's already one long uh, rough fixing session. Um, I want to see, I'm thinking about the upstairs, but the thing is like the one problem with the upstairs idea is that it doesn't really give you a whole lot, right? If you've already cleared out the upper stairs, um, like why would you want to go back? Uh, so I'm going to have to think about that. But again, there's something about implementing upstairs that I just strikes me as a good exercise to do. And I, I that is warming me to that idea, even if on paper it's a difficult one to justify. Um, again, I'm not going to go for the more traditional look, I don't think. I, I don't think it would hurt for me to think a little bit about how it looks and maybe user interface and things like that, but I don't know. That doesn't, that doesn't immediately speak to me, and I don't have... Well, okay, there were a couple of cases where I was push pushing certain keys and I was getting results different from what I was wanting. Like I was just kind of pushing pushing a button that was beside it. But um, I don't know, that doesn't strike me as an immediate uh, immediate fix. So I'll maybe put that on the list, but that's going to be lower on the list. But yeah, um, that's that. I think that's going to give me enough to work with. Uh, so my expectation for the next video... Just a reminder here, this is part of uh, week 
uh, seven for the um, the subreddit roguelike dev does the roguelike tutorial. Um, the following week, which I'll probably get an early start on, uh, is share your game conclusion. I don't know if this is supposed to be like when it starts or when you put in your homework or whatever, but I guess I, I, I'm going to be constrained by what my work week looks like anyway. But uh, for me, I figure I've got a couple of potential sessions this week. Again, it sort of depends on on what work is like and what some of my other obligations are like. But I figure I have maybe two or three sessions coming up where I might be able to do some more stuff for this. One of them will be spent doing just some practice for myself in terms of doc strings and such. But following that, um, we'll see how many things we can implement. And out of the list of things that I think are interesting, uh, what are the ones that I could realistically put into the game uh, in time to show everybody on the 27th? And then maybe as a kind of capstone, I will get the uh, roguelikes that have been developed by everybody else, and I'll play them for a little bit and uh, see, um, I don't know, celebrate, it seems. I realize this isn't like a I'm not a I'm not the influencer type of, of streamer. I'm not going to make anybody's game career out of it, but it maybe feels like a nice way to to cap it all off, to play a few of these and uh, see where other people took the tutorial. Anyways, thank you very much for watching and we will see you in the next one.